Good morning, everybody. We're in Perek Yud, chapter 10, verse 20, Pasuk Chaf. And the beginning of the Perek, if you recall from last week, dealt with two primary issues. Issue number one was the first four psukim of the Perek, which was the final of four tochachot, of rebukes, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to the Jewish people in hopes that they would do tshuva. They didn't, unfortunately, do tshuva. And as a result, the consequences arose. That one ended in Pasuk Daud. It was focused specifically on the leadership of the Dayonim and the Sofrei Ha'am and the scribes, the people who were in charge of really taking care of justice and law in, in the country. And then we began this um, prophecy that Yeshayahu gave against Assyria telling Ashur that because of their thoughts, that they really thought that they were in charge, that it wasn't that they were acting as agents of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but rather they thought themselves that it was their power that was allowing them to conquer the world. And they didn't stop at just doing what they were supposed to do, but they were so convinced they could do it all that ultimately it would lead to their downfall. In the rest of this parak, we're going to take two pieces. One is, well, actually three. One is we're going to talk about the Jewish people doing tshuva. Now, whenever the Jewish people do tshuva, it's good for us and not good for our enemies. And so as a result, after the first few psukim that we're talking about the tshuva occurring, next is going to happen what's going to happen to Ashur, the consequence to Ashur. And then finally, it's actually going to lay out their um, their battles when they began to attack Yerushalayim, which is the reason for this map that I gave. And this map will go, we'll deal with it in a little more detail, but if you notice, the map is focused on the Southern Kingdom, on Binyamin down to Yerushalayim. And the idea behind this map is really the Northern Kingdom has been uh, exiled because this latter part, the downfall of Assyria, of Ashur, occurs during the time of Hizkiyahu, not during Ahaz, and during the time of Chizkiyahu, he is going to be in Yerushalayim down here. The attack is going to be post-exile of the north, and it's going to be focused on Binyamin and downward, which is why this map just is from that small section of land north of Yerushalayim. And if you just want to get an idea of some of the distances, just to give you one piece, for example, this is Yerushalayim of old, and right over here is Ramah, which is about where Ramallah is. So it's really like a suburb of Yerushalayim today. The amount of space, you know, it looks very large, but the reality, uh, the amount of space we're dealing with is about uh, 15 kilometers total of space in, on this map. So it's a very detailed map. Those are the three pieces we'll deal with. And we begin in Pasuk Haf with a very simple statement, mahu, and it will be on that day. Now, what exactly is that day? Well, that day, the Mahari Kra says, on the day when HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to mete out justice against Ashur, when Ashur is going to fall. The Mitzudat David says that day is actually on the day when the Jews will see the miracles. It's related pieces because meting out justice against Ashur is a miraculous act that's going to take place. Lo Yosef od sh'ar Yisrael ufleitat Beit Yaakov lishain al makel. No longer will the remnant of Israel and the refugees of the house of Yaakov rely on those who smite it, who hid it. Now, the background of this is, first of all, we have this dual language, Leah Barbanel points out, that we're talking about She'er Yisrael Pleitat Beit Yaakov. Why do you have this double language? Because there are in the southern kingdom refugees from the north. When the north was conquered by Assyria, many people fled to the south. And so that's the She'er Yisrael. Pleitat Beit Yaakov are going to be the people from within Yehuda itself who remain. So they are going to be there. They no longer will, what? Rely on those who smite it. Now, what is the idea of those who smite it? Well, if you recall again, Ahaz had reached out to the king of Assyria to help him fend off the attacks of Aram, 
and of the Northern Kingdom. In other words, he made an alliance. It was literally an unholy alliance that he had made. And he made this horrific alliance. He's not the only king who, to have ever done this. Yeravam did it as well. Every, many kings, when they find themselves backed up against the wall, what they'll do is they'll seek out an ally to be able to help them defend the land. And not many times, but at times, those allies actually lead to the downfall because they're a more powerful nation. And at some point, they begin to attack them. So here the Radak says, this is referring very simply to at that point when the salvation is going to come, when the downfall of Assyria is going to come, the Jewish people will finally get it. Stop having an alliance with those people who are beating you up. The Makehu. Now, how was the Makehu? Well, very simply, according to the Radak, it was that Assyria had levied these extraordinary taxes on the Jewish people. And those taxes were such, were oppressive in nature just to have their support. It sounds a little bit like mafiosos. Okay, like the mafia, you know, we'll protect you. This was protection money that was happening. Now, interestingly, Rashi takes a different approach to this. Rashi says that the ones they were relying on was Mitzrayim. And there was another alliance also with the South, with Mitzrayim as well. And the same kind of concept would be taking place. V'nishan al Hashem Kedosh Yisrael Be'emet. And instead, they're going to rely on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, what is this emet? This emet is, it's as if it's written, v'nish'an be'emet al Hashem Kadosh Yisrael. Okay, it's a poetic form, so the, the words are a little bit moved around, but they're going to rely on the truthful, on the, on the real person, who they're supposed, the real strength that they're supposed to be relying on. Instead of those who oppress them, they're going to rely on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Relying on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, again, is this idea of them doing tshuva. Sha'ar Yashuv, Sha'ar Yaakov, El Kel Gibor, and Sha'ar Yashuv. Now, Sha'ar Yashuv is one of the names of Yeshayahu's sons. Sha'ar Yashuv was one of the names that he, was given, he had given to his son. But here it's not used as the name of his child, but it's talking about the Sha'ar Yashuv. The remnant will do tshuva. In other words, the remnant of the Jewish people will do tshuva. Sha'ar Yaakov, okay, and what's going to be, they're going to return El Kel Gibor. They're going to return, as Rashi says, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who is going to show them the strength against Sancheirev. Ki imiya amcha Yisrael kechol hayam. And at this point, what the Navi is saying, that even if the Jewish people, this is following Rashi, were as many as the sands of the sea, Sha'ar Yashuvbo, there's not going to be a lot left. In other words, even though there were once many Jews, following all of the attacks of Sancheriv, of the Assyrians, there's a remnant that remains. Shar Yashuv Bom. Kilayon, Harutz, Shotef, Tzedakah. Now, these four words we know are, two, are generally interpreted as two pairs of words. Kilayon, Harutz. Now, charutz, according to many of the Mephorshim, is very similar to another word, charut, which means it is decreed, it is final. Kilayon charutz, as a result, would mean that their destruction has been decreed about them. Now, why? Rashi says, kilayon charutz, shotef tzdaka, shotef tzdaka is going to be, the shtof is to like um, wash over the tzedakah. So according to Rashi's approach, um, that the people are going to wipe because of their righteousness, they will be able to wash away any form of destruction that might come upon them. That this is a statement focused upon the Jewish people. The However, the Radak takes actually the opposite approach. He says this is a statement, okay, that was directed towards Ashur, that the Assyrians are going to be wiped away because of, it's going to be a righteous wiping away of the, of the Assyrians. In other words, it's the same consequence. The Jews are going to be saved. Are the Jews going to be saved because they're so good? Or are the Jews going to be saved because the Assyrians are so bad? Now, they are doing tshuva in this process. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does step into the mix, but these four words are a little bit complicated, and we're not really sure who is the subject of them. Yeah. What tshuva do they do? 
What tshuva did they do? Yeah. What we say, they say El Kel Gibor. They're returning to the mighty God. They're, we say before them, they're going to Vinishan Al Hashem Kedosh Yisrael Bemet, and they're going to rely upon God. We don't see them clapping Al Chait. We don't. We don't see them necessarily uh, doing specific actions. Okay. But the Navi says they're going to return to God. This yeah. This is in the time of Chizkiyah. This is already happening. It's going to happen in the time of Chizkiyah, which is going to be the time of the salvation. But this never was given before the time. It, of well, it definitely was given before it happened. Otherwise, it's not a nevua. Okay. So, yeah. So many Mephoshim say that at this point, Yeshayahu is jumping over to prophecy in the time of Chizkiyahu HaMelech. And the reason is because he's going to describe later on the um, the, the attack of Sancheriv into Yerushalayim. And so he's uh, describing it as a, um, as a news report versus as a prophecy. So this is this could very well be in the time of Chizkiyahu, and that's why many of the Mephoshim take that approach. It isn't absolutely necessary, because once you're dealing with prophecy, um, well, prophecy happens before the action. So the prophecy could take place many, many years before. And the advantage of saying that it may have been in the time of Achaz, we're still kind of st sticking with the time of Achaz until we get to the time of, of Chizkiyahu. But... These are the psukim of transition between those two different monarchies. Yeah. What's the point of putting in Kichol Hayyam? I mean, what, what, what's the relevance of the numbers here? Was it a numbers thing? Well, is it a factor status? But if you remember, no, Kichol Hayyam, but it's reminiscent of the prophecies about the future, about the greatness of the Jewish people. That even if you had once been great, you're now just a remnant. You know, it's uh, it's an interesting thing. Sometimes people, uh, and, and we find this, I, I know people who like this as well, they get stuck in the past and they talk about people, they talk about, oh, what once was, and they can't transition into what is. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that this is part of that statement, that you were the nation that was as, you know, as great, as many as the sands of the sea, but you're not that anymore. Let's deal with realities. So the Gimia is more about if that you were rather than you were right. It was 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 right. Even if you were in that case, the way we how does the English translate Gimia? The beginning of the uh, verse twenty uh, two. How does it how does it translate? Or even if you even if you will be or were will be interesting. Okay, yeah, okay. Ki chala v'nechretsa. Now, Necheratza means, there's two possibilities. Necheratza could mean that it was, and this is the Mitzudot says, it was decreed. The destruction decreed, okay? Okay, the, the Radak says it is, Necheratza comes from the word to break. That actually, it, this destruction is, is shattering in a sense. Again, how does English translate it? Determined. Determined, okay, so that's... That's that's the Mitsudot, that's Rashi. Okay. He's run carry out. The beginning of verse 23. How does it in the English translate it? I can't hear you. What? Intense devastation. Intense devastation. It's interesting. Art spells translating it according to the Radak. Yeah. Intense. Uh, it's an intense. Okay, Sensino translates it. Holy determined. That's the Mitsudot. Okay, in other words, the word nechretza, we don't know which way it goes. By the way, this goes back to a point, and I just will take a, a side turn for one moment. Um, anytime you translate something, a translation is a commentary. And so it's fascinating. Art scroll generally sticks with Rashi. Okay, they've been pretty, they're pretty consistent sticking with Rashi's explanation. Okay, but whenever you translate, there's a commentary associated. How you translate this word or that word? Because we have all sorts of different opportunities of different words used to translate it. Uh, yesterday, my drasha yesterday I talked about anav, what the meaning of anav could be. Is it meek? Is it humble? Okay, is it unpretentious? And each one of them have different um, different implications or consequences, the way you would translate that word itself. Continuing, ki chalav Hashem elokim tzvakot oseh in other words, this is, you're going to see this is going to be done. Bekerev 
Kol Haaretz. Now, Bekerim Kol Haaretz, and Dr. Mikrab points out that this is, notice, this is going to be something that is going to affect the entire land of Israel. It's not something that it's affecting a subset of the land, not just in the north or not just in the south, but the entire land of, of Israel. The things are going to shift because of what happens. I thought this was just Concentrating on the south. Well, we're getting we're getting to the south. We're going to focus on the south later. But what is happening in all of these statements that have happened? We've also been talking about Shom, the people who are the Sherites from Shomron, the refugees from the Shomron coming into the south. All of this will change the entire dynamic. Now, by the way, the way it changes the dynamic, if you even remember, in the time of Chizkiyahu Melech, Chizkiyahu Melech, we talk about the level of Torah knowledge that existed was Midan ve'ad Ber Sheva was from the north, Dan, and all the way to the south, even though Chizkiyahu HaMelech was only the king over the south. okay, And the Shomron at the time of Chizkiyahu HaMelech was already you know, a different kind of place that was going on at that point. So as a result of all this, is happening in the whole land. Lachen, and therefore, Ko Amar Hashem Tzfakot, Hashem Elokim Tzfakot, Al Tira Ami Yoshev Tzion Me'ashur. Do not be afraid. Lachen. Now, why is lachen? Okay, well, one is lachen. According to Rashi, he offers two possibilities. Lachen can be the equivalent of a pro of a promise. It's a shvua. Therefore, I promise this. Do not, do not be afraid. Other possibility of this is not as a promise, but because of what you're going to know, because the fact that you know the Jews are going to do tshuva. Therefore, this is going to happen. Ami Yoshev Tzion. Now, Ami Yoshev Tzion, um, the Radak points out on this, is why is it Ami Yoshev Tzion? Now, in the past, we've used the terminology, the Shari Yaakov, the Shari Yashuv, the Shari Yisrael, Pleitat Beit Yaakov. Why is Ami Yoshev Tzion Mi Ashur? Because this is already a prophecy in the time of Chizkiyahu Melech. And in the time of Chizkiyahu Melech, Ashur has already exiled the north at 721. Chizkiyahu Melech comes along, and what is going on, they're attacking the south, and they surround and, and lay siege on Yerushalayim. Yeshayahu is telling them right now, don't be concerned, those of you who live in Sion, those of you who are threatened now, because he has destroyed most of the cities of Yehuda. All that really remains is Yerushalayim. B'Shevet Yakeka, Umateu Yisalecha Baderach Mitzrayim. Beshevet Yakeka. Beshevet Yakeka means very simply, he's going to hit you. But how is he going to hit you? If we're talking about the siege, the siege didn't have an attack yet. So Rashi says, Beshevet Piv, that what's going to happen is it's going to be, he's going to strike you with his mouth. Now, striking you with his mouth. If you recall the story from Malachim Bet, Perak Yudchet, I'm sure all of you remember it really well. When they lay siege on Yerushalayim, Rav Sheka, who was his general, was, was trying his best and did very well at embarrassing and belittling and demeaning Chizkiyahu and the Jewish people. He was yelling from outside the walls. They asked him not to speak in, in Ivrit, okay, because they didn't want to demoralize the people. He was having a good time demoralizing it. Uh, what was the name? Tokyo Rose was that in the Second World War? What was the name of that? The, the, the Japanese woman who was on the radio, okay? Okay, so if you think about Rav Sheka was doing the same kind of thing during the time of the siege, and that's where Rashi is coming. Now, uh, on the other hand, the Radak says, no, Beshevet Yakeka is, he's only hit you with a staff. He hasn't killed you. And he's lifting up Mateo Yisalecha, okay, Baderach Mitraim says Rashi, like he did to Mitraim. In other words, like, okay, Ashur went up against Mitraim, he stretched out the staff. In other words, he's threatened, he's caused wounds. He hasn't destroyed. Now, interestingly, the Radak says, no, no, no. Why is Mitzrayim here? He says, no, no, no. What Ashur is doing to you should remind you of what the Egyptians had done to you many years earlier in the time of our slavery there. They may have hit us and they may have lifted up their rod against us but they didn't succeed. 
the Maharit Kras says that even though they've hit us, even though they've been trying to get us, now HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying, I am going to pay them back, like Mitzrayim was paid back. So it's a combination of this Radak idea. Are we mentioning Mitzrayim as the current superpower in the time of Chizkiyahu? Or are we reminding the Jewish people of the history they had with Mitzrayim? Yeshayahu was saying to them, they've hit you. They've threatened you. Don't forget to the last people who tried that against you, those Egyptians, and look what happened to them. Baderach, okay, Baderach Mitzrayim. Ki od ma'at mizar. In a little bit of time. Now, mizar comes from the word ze'ira. Or ze'ar. In, in, Ar in Aramaic, we know ze'ira means little always. And it's, the, there's a Hebrew co connection to it, ze'ar. So he says, in a very small amount of time, in other words, very quickly, v'chala za'am v'api al tavlitam. What's going to happen? HaKodesh Borchu says, and this is Rashi, HaKodesh Borchu says, the anger that I had, in other words, the anger, v'chalazam, that anger which caused you to be punished through the agent of Ashur, and my wrath is going to cease. Now, what is al-tavlitam? Al-tavlitam, Rashi says that ultimately it's their, their blasphemy because of the blasphemy of Ashur. That God is going to say, what was the and what was the blasphemy of Ashur? That they thought that they were the ones who were in charge of the world. The Assyrians thought that they were punishing the Jews because they were powerful, not because Akodesh Bor who wanted them to be punished. And so, because of that blasphemy, that's going to happen. It is Tavli Tam is something that's despicable. In this context, the despicable action is the blasphemy. The Marie Cross says, okay. Um, that al tavlitam is not about the Assyrians; it's about the Jews. The Marie Kras says, "My anger is going to end over what you had been doing because you've done shuvana. So you did shuvah. You were getting beaten up really bad for doing bad things. You stopped doing the bad things. I'm going to move on." Kodesh Baruch Hu says, "I'm going to take care of you." But yeah, Zahar means a little, tiny bit. Okay, yeah. Okay, I know this is super weird. It could be. Okay, and, um, tablet. Nobody talks about it as, as a different spell in tablo, like panels. Well, that's... Uh, I, because in Lachish, there was... There, there was tra uh, there, the, I forgot exactly what they call it, Lachish panels. In the Temple of Nineveh that Assyria yeah. had, he, built, um, he wrote there about how he destroyed Lachish in the end. He was super... Uh, I'm sure, I'm not sure was super powerful, and it was about his cult of the Oats of Yandi. Nobody talks about that, but it just put that to mind. There are these many panels about Lachish. Yeah, I, I guess the, the problem I would have is, but that tablet is with a tet. Right. Okay, it's with a tet, and I, I don't know, but it's with a tet. No, it's with a tet, and it's also really the original is tavla, with an olive. Okay, so I, I, I'm not sure. Here it comes from the word tevel. Like something, um, Tevel, when you, um, Tevel is, um, Tevel. huh? No, Tevel, Taf Vet Lamed. The, you have the phrase in Vayikra, Tevel Asu. They did something oh, right. despicable. Right. Okay. Um, so, but it's just, yeah, I, I hear I hear the language, but I'm not, I, it's, a, it's a nice drush as long as you don't have to spell it out. Right. Okay, yeah. it works out really well. Okay. okay. It says, V'orer alav Hashem Tzvakot Shot, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to uh, arise upon it or is going to uh, or, 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 or to, uh, to raise up to what? Awaken, thank you. On it, the shot, what is shot? The shot, Rashi says, is, is the kind of beating. Kemakat midyan batsur orev, umate walayam, just like the, the way he smote Midian in Sur Orev, we'll get to that in a minute. Umateu al Hayam, and his staff is going to be over the sea, Venasao Bederach Mitzrayim, and he's going to be carried off as was Mitzrayim. Where are we mentioning two major historical events? In Sefer Shoftim, in Perak Zion, this one I'm sure you remember. Okay, in the time of Gidon, the Shofet Gidon. Gidon was brought in 
to attack the uh, the Midianim who were attacking the Jews. Gideon and Gideon, instead of taking the full force, if you recall, took a small force of men to attack this massive force of Midian, and as they were um, fleeing the Midianites from the Jews. Two of their major generals, one's name was Orev and one's name was Zaev, they were the first ones who were killed during the retreat. And so when we talk about major victories, military victories of the Jewish people, one major victory, and we've had Midian show up before in, in their consciousness, was this victory that happened four or 500 years earlier. But it was still, it, it was the model of how God saves them when they're a small number versus a vast army. They recalled it. And so he says, Kemakat Midian Betsur Orev, the place where Orev, where the general Orev and the general Zev were killed was called uh, Tsur Orev, the, the rock of Orev. That's one. The other is obviously Umateo Alayam and Aso is just like we're talking about again, Egypt. Here, we have two possibilities of who that Mateh would be. Again, a disagreement between Rashi and Radak. Rashi says it is like the staff of Moshe for the splitting of the sea. That power of the staff of Moshe. Okay, just remember Charlton Heston putting out the staff. Okay, mm -hmm. sea splits. Now, the Radak says no, that this is the Mateh of Paro that this was the staff of Pharaoh who led the Egyptian armies to attack the fleeing Jews. And he were, and all of them were, were drowned at the sea. Okay, now uh, one more time, what Rashi says, Rashi says this is talking about the, the strength of Gidon, the strength of Moshe. It's consistent. The focus is on the two leaders that were there and what they did. But he says, means we're going to be carried off like Mitzrayim had been carried off, which means they're going to be destroyed. However, the Ibn Ezra has an interesting piece. The Ibn Ezra says, no, Ben Asoba Derech Mitzrayim, this is Pharaoh. If you remember, there's a machloket in Chazal. What happened at the sea? Did Paro drown at the sea with the armies? Or was Paro left alone and ashamed, and he had to go back by himself to Egypt. The movie is very clear on that. And by the way, the movie, if you, just to be just to be fair with the movie, by the way, just to be fair with the movie, if you ever watch the credits on the movie, they had great Bible scholars who consulted on the movie. They still took some, some liberties, okay? But many, many of the things that they, that they show in the movie have basis in Midrashim. Okay, and so it's a fascinating thing. I once gave an assignment to students to watch the movie and to pick, a, you know, a scene and find for me the midrashim that supports those scenes because almost everything you can find the midrash, almost everything. Now, going back a moment, what happens? So the Ibn Ezra says, "What's going on here?" Venas all bederach mitzrayim, and they will just like Pharaoh had to go back to mitzrayim all alone shamed, the same thing is going to happen to Sancheres after his army is going to be decimated when they place a siege. He's going to have to go back to Assyria, his tail between his legs, just like Paro had the same thing. Mm -hmm. So Mitzrayim, he will be carried off. Who's the he? Now he will be carried off, could be the Assyrians in general, or it could be talking about Sancheres in particular. And one more time, we're getting that on that day. Yasur Subalo, the heavy burden will be removed from on your shoulders. In other words, what's the heavy burden that was here? They were subjugated to the Assyrians. They were threatened by the Assyrians. They were paying these massive taxes to the Assyrians. And it's yoke and also the yoke from on your neck, we're using obviously the imagery of a of an animal of burden, okay, of an ox. Vichubal ol mipnei shamein. Vichubal ol mipnei shamein. Now this is a, again one of those great phrases that we're not really sure. Okay, chubal we know is going to be destroyed. 
Okay, in modern Hebrew, unfortunately, we know the phrase mechablim, a terrorist. Okay, those who create the destruction. It's the same shorish. V'chubal ol, and so the yoke will be destroyed mipnei shamin. Okay, now what is mipnei shamin? So according to Rashi, Rashi offers two possibilities. That um, that Chizkiyahu was going to be a person who was going to be beloved by his people because of the shemen of the of the of the first the shemen the wealth that was going to happen the prosperity that was going to occur in his time that that's the shemen we're talking about by yishman yishun vayivat was the negative when the Jews become prosperous and all of a sudden they begin to rebel but here is going to be a case where they're going to be prosperous and that will break that peace he offer, offers also and he talks about the fact that there is a midrash, and this is a famous midrash, that in the time of Chizkiyahu, um, there was such Torah learning that took place that Chizkiyahu actually he uh, he threatened people if they didn't learn Torah, and there was extraordinary knowledge. They learned all of the most complicated pieces, and it was as I mentioned before, from the north to the south, everyone knew these information, and Chizkiyahu was the one who made sure that the Batei Knesset and the Batei Midrash were open, he provided the Shemen. That's what he did. Now, the Targum offers a third possibility. And the Targum, in this case, um, for me, is the easiest to understand. The Targum says, Ve'yit berun malchei amamaya. And the kings of the nations will be broken, min kadam meshicha before the one who is anointed. The shaman is the shaman of anointing before the Mashiach. Okay, that in this case, we're talking about Chizkiyahu, who had the potential, if you recall, we talked about it last week, the week before, Chizkiyahu HaMelech had the potential of being the Mashiach. And so he, they're going to be broken before the one who bore the oil itself. Now, writes the, the Navi, Ba al ayat avar b'migron. Now, all of these places that we're going to encounter now in the next few psukim are going to be places. It really talks about till pasuk lamid bet. So it's another three psukim, three four psukim are going to be places that you'll find on this map. Okay. Uh, for those who are online, I'll pull up the map and take me one second. I apologize. I'm going to pull up the map. Uh, okay. Okay. Now on this map, what you'll notice. Okay, is that let's start slowly. Baal Ayat Avarba Migron. So the first place he went was Ayat. Where is Ayat? Ayat is the city which we also identify as Ai. You remember when the Jews first crossed over the uh the Jordan? When they crossed over, they went to Yericho, which is about here on the map. Okay, over here. And then they went to Ayat, which is the city of Ai, where there was, unfortunately, if you recall, there was some death which took place over the city of Ai. Because some people died because of Ai. Now, they first go, it starts out with Ayat. Then, Avar Migron. If you notice, we're not really sure, but he passes Migron. And it's talking about Sancheirov's attack. He goes here. And then after Migron, then Lemichmas, Yafkid Kelav. And in Michmas, now Michmas, some, nowadays there's a Yeshuv, Michmas, but Michmas is actually not where Michmas was. Michmas is most likely, there's an Arab village next to it called Muchmas. Okay, Muchmas, which is next to Michmas, is probably the original place. The Arabs were very, very good to us in the sense that they preserved the ancient names of the places. But he's going to leave his vessels. Now, why he's going to leave his vessels? So the Radak says, that he goes ahead and he's going, traveling, trying to attack so quickly into Yerushalayim, he's going to leave behind some of the armaments because he doesn't think it wasn't going to be necessary. It's going to be so easy to capture. I'll leave the stuff and we'll be able to move faster. And that's what he's Yafkid Kelav. Avru Ma'abara. And then he passes by Ma'abara. Now the Ma'abara, we're not really sure. There is a suggestion. It's like right here. Okay. Others says this is by a wadi called uh, Tzwanit, 
okay, which is next to Michmas. There's a wadi there. There's a vadi, um, okay, that could be, but it is, let's assume this for a minute. This map, by the way, is from Olama Tanakh, okay? Um, then he goes past um, there, Geva Malon Lanu, and then he goes to Geva. Now, in Geva, Geva, we know where Geva was, and you'll see it on the map as well. You'll just see it continue along the red. It was one of the Arei Levi'im, but we also know Geva from Sefer Shoftim again. Geva was the place, Pilegish Begiva, where that horrific story took place, and there was a civil war that resulted, and almost all of the tribe of Binyamin was decimated as a result of that civil war. That was in Geva, okay? And when they go to, when they go to Geva, Okay, it is Malon. Okay, it's going to be a place, the, the Malon Lanu, it's going to be a place where they're going to rest overnight. Malon Lanu, not for us, but Lanu, like in the sense of resting. Then, Haridaharama. Then, the people, when all of this is happening, the people of Rama are quaking in their boots, they're shaking. They're afraid of what's going to happen because they know of the devastation that is taking place. Rama is in the area of Ramallah. Okay, um, it is a place we're familiar with, Devora. We, 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 we have, we, we have uh, all of these ideas of where Ramah was. Ramah is not far from Ramallah today. It's uh, actually an Arab village called, called Aram, uh, Aleph with a chunchuk on top, uh, Reish Mem. And then he goes over to Givat Shaul Nasa. Okay, we say that Givat Shaul, the place, of Givat Shaul, which is really Tal Al Pul in the the Arabic, it's not the Givat Shaul of today. It's not where Angel Baker is. Okay, <laughs> it's uh, it's on the other side. Okay, uh, it leads for a very very um, you know beautiful picture if you believe that it's where uh, Givat Shaul is of today. But it's not it's it's not far from there. Givat Shaul we do know is the place where Shaul Hamelach had a palace because if you remember in the final scene where he departs from Shmuel, their final scene, Shmuel goes back to, to Ramah and he goes back to Givat Shaul. He goes back to his place. They separate and there was some kind of palace that Shaul must have had there and they run away. Tzahali Kolech Bat Galim. And so Bat Kal Galim, okay, they raise your voices, Bat Galim. Now, we're really not 100% sure where Bat Galim is. Hakshivi Laisha Aniyana Tot. But however, near Galim is a place called Laish. He says, go ahead, listen, Laish, Aniya Anatot. And Anatot, now we know about Anatot also. Anatot was the birthplace of Yirmiyahu Anavi. Okay, and today it's it's like take up the cry aniot. Okay, now uh, today where aniot anat uh, where anatot is, we have it right here. Okay, if you have right here is anatot on the map, you'll notice it. And there, it's today it's an Arab village again, Faranata. Okay, where you have that same word that's preserved, nadeda mad na. Okay, we don't know exactly where Madmina is, but they 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 moved. Yoshve Hagevim Heizu, and the people of Gevim. Now Gevim Heizu Rashi says they began to escape. One more time, there is a suggestion that this place Yoshve Gevim the Gevim Geva is actually um and uh, is actually on Harat Sofim on one side of Harat Sofim where we have today caverns and we have cisterns that are there that might be that. So we're already really in what we call Yerushalayim, if it's Mount Scopus area, even though it was in those days the outskirts. Od hayom benov la'amod. There was still the time that they were going to, uh, during the day they stood at Nov and they were as, you know, Fef Yadohar Batzion, um, and he was waving his hand at Yerushalayim in Nov. Now, where's Nov? Well, Nov is Shuafat. Um, Shuafat is um, right across from Ramat, uh, yes. Ramat Shlomo. Okay, Ramat Shlomo on the other side of the, of the road from the Ramat Shlomo is a, an Arab uh, village and became a refugee camp called Shuafat. It's probably right there. There is another suggestion that Nov might be in a... Um, uh, a, a little bit off of Shuafat Amatur, which is another Arab village as well. But we're really, basically, in, in modern Yerushalayim, we're right there. And by the way, Nov, this is the city of Kohanim. If you remember the place where Shaul killed everybody, Nov is where Shuafat was. You know, sometimes we think of these places being so far off. 
Israel was a what well, is a small country, and you were, and the area where much of the action that took place in Huda is a very small area of space as well. And so he's standing there and he's shaking his hand. Now, the Radak says it's a little different. Okay, the Radak says that what is happening here is the people of city of of Nov. Okay, they're going to um, be waving their arms over the ultimate destruction. They're going to be able to watch how Ashur is going to be destroyed following the siege around Yerushalayim. And so they're waving their hands. But but Rashi brings a medrash. And the medrash is what I handed out to you, a medrash from the Gemara in Sanhedrin. And so if you have it, great. If not, I'm just going to read it. I, I handed it out to you as well, and I'll share it on the screen for the people who are online. Um, it's Gemara Sanhedrin, Sadeh, hey, I'm an Aleph. This is uh, the version from the uh, from Sfaria, which is the translation of Koran and Shainzalz. And so just to, to look at it very quickly, my od hayom benov la mod, what does it mean, this phrase we just read? Amar Rav Huna, so explain Rav Huna, oto hayom nishtayem ona shel nov. And that, that was the final day. There was still going to be an element of punishment that had to happen over nov. Remember what happened with nov, that, the, that Shaul had killed all of the Kohanim in the, in the city of nov. It was a terrible massacre. And as a result, and so what happened was the astrologers told Sanacherev on his attack, and he's moving quickly. They said, listen, if you go now, you're going to be successful. You're going to be able to conquer. Okay. But if you don't go right now, you're not going to be able to do it. He says, so the Gemara says, wait a second. You know, what he was able to do in the course of this battle, as he was moving so quickly, most armies, most people would take 10 days to travel the amount of time he did in one day. He was just on, on a roll. However, he to Yerushalayim, but when they got down to Yerushalayim, they went ahead and they put out the mats and made them and let them gave them like a platform to stand on. Okay, and he was able to see the entire city of Yerushalayim in front of him. Kichazim, and when he saw it, izutar be'ene. Izutar, remember, it looked really Yerushalayim looked easy. It looked small to him. Amar halo halo da he carted Yerushalayim. He said, "I said, is this the city of Yerushalayim?" Dala ar gishit kol mi rite vala kavshit kol medinta. Okay, he says, this is the city where I've gone ahead and I've made all the tumult for which I've had to conquer everything. He's the ear of a chalash and mikol karakei amamaya de kavish bitkof yadi alam. Okay, vikamu menid bereshe movilu meite bi yede al tur beit mikdash de vitzion val azrata de Yerushalayim. He says, this is a little dinky city. It's smaller than all the other cities he went. And so what did he do? He just shook his head, okay, and waved his hand in contempt over Yerushalayim, over the, the Harabayim. So that is, if you remember, the opening post of Od Hayom Benov La'amod, right? He's standing there, San Cherev, he's standing there, and he's waving, you know, Fef Yado, and he's waving his hands, Harabatzion, over the mountain of Harzion. This is the way the Medrash sees it. Amri Nishtebe Yada Ha'idna, okay? He said, they said to him, let's go ahead and attack. Amarlu, he said to them, Tamitu, you guys are tired. Lemachar, let's wait till tomorrow. Aitali called Chad Vechad Minaihu Gulmo. Okay. And you're going to be tired. Everyone is going to bring me a, a piece um, uh, of the rocks. Harag Mine Okay. And, uh, and, and then immediately it came. Okay. By Hibalaila, who it was at that night. Vayetim Allah Hashem. And it was on that night when the angel of God came, 185,000 soldiers were killed. They woke up in the morning. Okay. And what happened? They're just corpses. Papa, Okay. That is that when a uh, a fight is kept overnight. It disappears. Okay, wasn't conquered when it was supposed to be conquered. So Rashi brings this medrash, 
And Rashi brings this medrash to describe what's happening here, od hayom v'nov la'amod. Unlike the Radak, who says that it's the people of Nov who are watching what's going to happen, the destruction says, no, we've been talking about the advance of Sanacherev and his army southward towards Yerushalayim, and it's going to happen at the end of this whole story that in Nov he's going to stand, and he's going to wave his hands over Yerushalayim, oh, okay, and he's going to say, I can conquer it easily, I'm going to wait, and as a result, that's going to be his downfall. He neighed, therefore, Adon Hashem Tzfakot, Misaif Kura Bemaratza. That God, now notice it's Ha'adon. Why are we calling Ha'adon Hashem Tzfakot? We've had different ways we referred to Akodesh Borchu before. We have talked about Akodesh Borchu, if you recall, Hashem Elokim Tzfakot, right? We, here we're talking God, the Lord or the Master. Why are we saying God is the Lord or the master? Because after this, this description of the destruction of Ashur, God is basically saying, now you see who's in charge. I'm the boss. Okay. I'm it. Okay. It's not him. It's me. Hineha don Hashem Tzfakot. Misaef. Now there's all machloket about what misaef means. Misaef could mean will remove branches. Okay, but and this and it could be as um, continues misaev pura b'ma'aratsa and removes well actually remove I'm sorry remove leaves remove the branches the pura b'ma'aratsa it's a, a, a what is it a, it's a it's a kind of uh, a saw or or something like that okay he's got to trim the trees verame hakoma and those who are tall. Now, who are the ones who are tall? Giduim will be cut down. Now, I'm using an imagery which has been, which Yishayahu used before, of talking about forests, the mighty forests and the mighty trees, to symbolize power. And so Yishayahu says, all of the leaves, the branches, they're going to be cut. The bigger you are, you're going to be cut down. Rashi says, the bigger you are, those are refer referring specifically to the melachim and the sarim, to the kings and to the officers, they're going to become. Vagvoim yishpalu. And those who are high up will be brought down. V'nikaf sivchei hayar bebarzel. And in fact, it'll be cut the thickets of the forest with barzel. Now the thickets of the forest could be and in, Rashi just says that these are the important people. Okay, the Radak has an interesting piece. Th what's a thicket? A thicket. T h i c k. Right? What is it? But what makes a thicket different than a bush or different than a tree? It's a clump. It's it's intertwined. So what the Radak says here that this word is being used to refer to all of the different officials who had come together, even though they had different interests, they'd all come together with Sancheriv, and they kind of inter, they got mixed up one in another in a bad way. So this is the thicket, are all those people who were kind of coming together and joined in. Not that they all had their own, they all had their own agendas, but one thing they did is they joined with Sancheriv. It sometimes reminds me of modern politics, you know, where you, you can go Republican or Democrat, you can go either way, you can go either either party if you want, you can go the Republicans or the Democrats, but nowadays what seems to happen is if somebody goes against one, everybody jumps up in defense of that one, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you attack a Democrat, everyone jumps on, oh, that Democrat, that person is fantastic, wonderful, you're terrible. And the same thing if you're a Republican. They're all joining together. They're all in this thicket. They're all kind of mixed in. And by the way, it ain't good. And this is part of why he's using this word. The iron, in other words, the tool is going to cut him down. And the Levanon, now Levanon is a, is a real forest, okay? We talk about the, the cedars of Lebanon. Those are going to be, one more time, brought down. They will fall. Now, the Radak says that Lebanon was specifically, that term for a forest was used here to refer to Eretz Yisrael, the people who had attacked within Eretz Yisrael. However, the Avot the Rabbi Natan has an interesting piece on this last point. Vahal Lebanon ba'adir yipol. 
we see that Levanon, in, the, in terminology of Chazal, and you can even see it in Malachim sometimes, is a, another, is a synonym for the Beit HaMikdash. That the Beit HaMikdash is called the Levanon. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he's, this is foretelling, according to the Avot de Rabbi Natan, this is foretelling the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash is only going to occur by an Adir, by a major king will be able to destroy the Beit HaMikdash. And we're talking about, until this point, the destruction of Assyria, but there is one last point, the Avot Rabbi Natan, and it's Midrashic, no question about it, says, just know, this guy couldn't have done it, they couldn't have done it, but there will be an Adir, there will be some king, not a Hediot, who is going to be able to cause the fall of the Beit HaMikdash. It's right, but it is the Avot Rabbi Natan. Okay, now it is not the classic before Shima on the Daf on the page, uh, but it is one of those pieces. So what happens here in this piece in the end of Perak Yud, and we're, we're going to end with this, is we see actually a transformation of two things. One is we're going from the era of Ahaz into the era of Chizkiyahu. Ahaz was an evil king. Chizkiyahu was a very righteous king. Ahaz was the time of the Jews sinning and therefore their punishment, the wrath that was caused by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which led to Assyria being able to be as powerful as they were. They, that the Jews then do tshuva. As a result, HaKadosh Baruch Hu then steps in, brings down Ashur, and we, I think we talked about it last week as well. You know, Ashur may have been the instrument of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but just like the famous Medrash about Paro, you know, Paro says, you said the Jewish people are going to be vavadum vinu otam arbamot shanai. They're going to be enslaved. They're going to work. They're going to be um, suffering for 400 years. God, I fulfilled what you told me to do. I was doing it. And a Kodesh Baruch Hu responds to him and said, who said it had to be you? Okay. Ashur went ahead and Ashur was fulfilling the, the wishes in a sense of God. But they went too far. And their punishment is going to be, it's not just the salvation of the Jews, but also the downfall of the Assyrians. We're going to stop right here. Next week, we're going to pick up with Perak Yudalif and uh, have a wonderful day.